Timo. Yeah. That was our first uh, listen to Wagner. Yeah. This is the guy you want for Wagner, I can tell. <laughs> uh, does he have like a ancient uh, German Celtic affiliation? You know, he's Welsh and stuff. He just seems like he's the perfect guy for the gig. It's true. It sounds that way. And the Welsh, you know, have that unbelievable tradition of singing in their culture anyway. Right. They have to fight for it all their lives, right? Yeah. And so the ancient Celtic people of, of Wales and Ireland and Scotland are related to the ancient Germans. That's what Wagner is writing about. Yeah. They're the same, peop- they're the same people. It's true. And so what are you hearing musically, uh, Timo, from the Italians to, to Wagner? There's, well, the Italians, it's, there's like a big uh, kind of battle royale between Verdi and Wagner. They're like two different camps of, of music. And uh, Wagner's music is such a departure from uh, the ordinary dramatic style that, that the Italians are doing. Right, They're doing something that's a little bit more... Um, music of the people and music in the streets and music of passion and love and Wagner is the complete art this is taking on a whole different scale and uh, every nuance of every bit of it seems to be invested with this other direction for the thing let alone everything being five hours long how do how do these <laughs> how do these I mean I know that like in movies and theater and stuff you you ask yourself how do they do a five hour production? Well, you do it a three minute song at a time, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like the storyboards in film, right? And yet, with Wagner, what made his music so different too from the Italians is that they basically composed in little segments, like song, duet, trio, ensemble with chorus, song, duet, trio, and he revolutionized everything by saying. It's just going to be through composed. There aren't going to be separate mm. numbers, so to speak. Well, that's why there's that added chromaticism in Wagner's music, because you need to sustain the story for a very long time, whereas you're not just doing a, a hit parade. Right? right. He called it endless melody, that there yeah. would not be just little melodies. There would be one endless melody. That's what he wanted. There's also some fundamental harmonic differences and in innovations going on. Like Wagner's music, the, the real sound that you're hearing very often is a minor 7 flat 5 chord. And yes. That, and that was a chord that was still new at the time. And that's one of the chords. And some of the stuff they do on dominant chords, too. Those are the new chords that sort of usher in the next wave of chords. And then that turns into the polytonality after Stravinsky and, and those guys. Yeah, exactly. Also, I read that Wagner was the f- first or one of the first important composers to compose both the libretto and the music. Exactly. That's yeah. right. The whole yeah. thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Control Freak, Control freak Royale. <laughs> Indeed. But, but, also, the, he creates a lot of controversy, uh, for the, not just for the things that he said, uh, but the the subject matter of the operas is, you know, with this ancient Celtic Germanic stuff and there it's so long and over the top and, and gushing and just it's so much and everybody was influenced by someone like Debussy, one of my idols, was so deeply taken by it when he was young and completely rejects it by the time he's older as German. I don't want to be German, I wanna be French, just mm-hmm. get 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 away from this guy. You know, let alone the the controversial stuff that he said and did. But he was such a revolutionary uh, as a musician and composer that no later composer could ignore what Wagner had changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A huge, huge shadow. Yeah. Um, So now we get to turn to um, our first Russian composer and and a Russian singer. That's right. Anna Netrebko, who has become maybe one of the top five box office draws for opera in the whole world. She is the current reigning star in terms of everyone wants her. She's in demand in every major opera house. And once again, I was lucky enough to be present at the creation when she was 20 something years old and sang uh, the part of Natasha in War and Peace, this giant epic opera by Prokofiev that we did as a co-production between the Met and the Marinsky Theater in St. Petersburg, Russia. And uh, back then, she was just another, you know, beautiful soprano with a gorgeous voice. We didn't know she was going to become the reigning world star, but here she is, the reigning world star. 
Wow. Now tell us uh, what we're going to be listening to here. So she's going to sing um, an aria from Iolanta by Tchaikovsky. Uh, and in the opera, it's about a blind girl. And she, the blind girl sings, Achevo eta prejde niznala, which means, why didn't I know earlier? Meaning, why didn't she know about everything there was to know about the world? Because her parents have kept her in the dark about being blind. She doesn't even know she's blind. <laughs> 